to welcome everyone. I know some of us is our first time in the space, some of our first time at the Dharma Collective, so welcome. Uh, my name is Tig O'Malley. I can speak in pronouns, or you can just call me Tig. Um, I am a meditation teacher and a contemplative artist. I started meditating in grade school as part of our curriculum uh, at the grade school that I went to. And it's just something that stuck with me, stayed my entire life as my career kind of took off and my stress increased, my meditation practice deepened um, to a point where I really wanted to share. can't hear you. Sorry to interrupt you, but we can't hear you very well. Yes, can you get a little closer to the mic? How's that? Not much better. Is this better? Getting toward better. <laughs> it was quiet. How's that? Getting I think better. It's okay. been in there before. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some of you that have sat with me before, you've heard me say that technology is the best indicator, indicator for practice. So when something like this happens or Zoom freezes or something like that, it's a chance to just take a deep breath and be with what's coming up. <laughs> so we've gotten plenty of chance to practice over the past couple of years. Uh, so it seems like this might be better. You can hear me. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Noam. Um, actually, I think this is a really good chance to say, you know, if anything's coming up, if you can't hear me, uh, if you have questions, you know, feel free to interrupt. Pretty informal here. So um, whatever we can do to help you feel supported in the practice is, um, is great for us. So I was saying that um, I got to a point where I wanted to kind of uh, train and to teach and share the, the practices and the tools that have helped me on my journey. Um, so I'm currently teaching in a network of hospitals and in a few universities. Um, I teach mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a contemplative program based on Dharma, but taught in a secular format. And I also teach cultivating emotional balance, which is very similar, but it's a deeper dive into emotions. Um, I <clears throat> hold space for parents in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, sit with them on stress reduction, breath work exercises. I teach at Pratt Institute, which is a design school in New York City, kind of weaving together art and meditation. Um, and I'm also teaching uh, a course called Mindfulness-Based Queer Resilience for a research study at Brown University. Um, so kind of tracking how these practices and tools can help support the mental and emotional and physical well-being of young queer men. Um, so tonight I'll be teaching through that lens of contemplative science and also spirituality and also my lived experience. And so that will involve uh, the lens that I experience life through. So with that comes my own privilege and my unconscious bias. And so I try and teach as universal as I can, but there might be things that I say or weigh things, way that I say things that might not land for you or might not be true for your experience. And so I really wanna invite you to um, share what's coming up for you and we can grow and learn together. Uh, this is the SFDC, the San Francisco Dharma Collective. One of the things I love about this organization is that it's an umbrella for Dharma. So there isn't one, just one lineage um, and it really opens the door for kind of unique and innovative programming, such as a class like tonight. Um, so uh, as, as Karen was saying, you know, we're run on Dana, so donations, it's not an exchange for the teaching. The teachings are free. Um, any money uh, or resources that you donate to the center are so we can keep it going and so the teachers can keep going. Um, but as Karen said, that um, all walks of life are welcome here, whether regardless of financial situation. So this class, it's our second class in the series, Bringing Mindfulness Home to the Dharma. And so in our culture, mindfulness has been pulled away from the Dharma and taught in secular uh, settings like the programs that I teach in hospitals and universities, there's a lot of benefit to that. We can get these teachings out in a more universal way. 
Um, we can teach in public institutions. Um, but there's also some drawbacks is that we're losing the connection to the entire system of Dharma that mindfulness is a part of. And with that are ethics, compassion, um, how to be present for life, um, more than just a practice of watching the mind. Um, and so the idea of this class is kind of bringing the best of secular mindfulness, the fact that it's universal, that it's trauma informed, uh, that um, you don't need to have a certain spiritual point of view in order to practice, but then bringing it back home to the system that it came from. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, the recording from the first class is on YouTube, uh, where I talk a lot about why this class is the way it is. And it's not so much about uh, pitting the secular versus the spiritual or demonizing one or the other. It's how they weave together and how they inform each other. One of the best things that I love about secular mindfulness is that it's modern. We know it's been modernized. We know how the modern Western mind learns and practices. And so when we plug that kind of um, pedagogy into Dharma, some really amazing things can happen. So tonight, uh, last month, we talked about kind of what mindfulness is and how we practice and how the secular and spiritual definitions inform each other. So tonight, we're going to dive into attachment. Uh, and so we'll look at craving mind and um, we'll touch into some gratitude. So we're going to start with a practice. Uh, we're going to be doing a body scan practice. Um, and so we'll be using sensations or lack of sensation in the body as we scan through part by part, just to be aware of what's happening in the present moment. For this practice, you can lay down if you like. So there's plenty of room here in the space. If you'd like to lay down, there's cushions and blankets. Um, at home, you're welcome to lay down if you'd like. Uh, you can lay flat on the floor, or there's a pose called astronaut's pose that a lot of people like for body scan, where you lay flat on the floor and then put your knees at a 90 degree angle over a chair or an ottoman. It helps take the pressure off the lower back. So um, as I introduce the practice, we can kind of settle into the posture that we've chosen. It's perfectly fine to stay seated. I actually practice the, the body scan seated. Um, it allows me to be more alert and awake for the practice. Um, but however you'd like to sit or lay down, even stand up, you may also change position uh, partway through the practice if that's feeling supportive for you. Just a note about taking care of yourself. The, you're gonna hear me cue this in the practice. A lot of emotions are stored in the body. So when we bring our attention to different parts, it may feel overwhelming or very intense and know that you can always take a break. If you need to open your eyes, if they're closed, look around the room, Take a deep breath, feel the ground underneath you, and listen. If it's safe to come back to the practice, please come back. And if not, just rest. Um, <clears throat> so um, we can begin to close the eyes if that's feeling comfortable, or perhaps soften them to a gaze. Maybe lower the view down to a surface in front of you. And here in San Francisco, it's beginning to be the nighttime. So there might be some sleepiness. It might be more supportive to leave a little bit of light coming through the eyes, not shutting them completely, if that's the case for you. And as we make this transition from the outer world and our doing goal-oriented lifestyles into the inner world of just being, Nothing to strive for, no goal, just an intention to be present, to notice what arises. Perhaps there's a, another intention you'd like to set for this practice, a way of being or an attitude for this time of practice, maybe to be relaxed, to be open-minded. And then let's start to allow the awareness to drop out of the thinking mind and down into the feeling body and awareness of the posture that you've chosen, how the limbs may be folded or extended.
Noticing if there's a particular energy in the body right now. No right or wrong, no should or should not. Just noticing what's here right now. Taking a moment to feel the contact the body's making with whatever's beneath it. Maybe it's a chair, a floor, a cushion. And as we become aware of this ground beneath us, just a moment to acknowledge this land that we're on. In San Francisco, we're on the ancestral land of the Olani people. And wherever you may be zooming in from, just taking a moment to acknowledge the guardians of the land that you're on. And even though those of us that are zooming in and those of us that are in the room may be far away from each other, we're all resting here on the same ground. So feeling that support that energy of the Sangha of community. And then returning to that sensation in the body of the ground, the contact, the support. And now let's gather up all of our attention Drop all the way down through the body and becoming aware of the left foot. Starting to zoom in on the left big toe. And just noticing any sensations, perhaps tingling, maybe a pulsing, temperature, moisture. Perhaps there's a lack of sensation here in the left big toe. And whatever it is that we're finding here, it's part of the present moment. Bringing the awareness down to the pinky toe. And awareness of all the toes in between. And as we continue scanning through the body, you, there may be parts of the body that are missing for you or maybe shaped differently than how I'm guiding. And that's part of your own unique experience. So you can rest with another part of the body, or take a break until you're ready to come back to the practice. And now shifting the awareness to the bottom of the left foot. Notice any sensation or lack of sensation in the ball of the left foot. The arch of the left foot. The heel of the left foot. And coming around to the top of the left foot perhaps an awareness of skin or bones just underneath the surface. Sensing deep into the left foot, feeling the body from the inside. And as we practice focusing our attention on sensations in the body, it's natural to notice the mind moving away into thoughts or sounds, maybe sensations in other parts of the body. Remembering that that's never a problem in this practice. In fact, it's what we're practicing, noticing when the mind slips away and then gently without judgment coming back to the body. Now let's gather up the attention and shift over to the right foot. 
Focusing the attention in the right toes. And exploring any sensations here in the right toes. And trying your best not to visualize the right toes or move the right toes. Just sense into anything that's coming forward in your awareness here, the right toes. And then scanning down to the bottom of the right foot, the ball, the arch, the heel. around to the top of the right foot. And then sensing deeply inside the right foot, the bones, the muscles, the ligaments. as we continue our journey scanning through the body, we're going to move up into the legs. And I'll offer guidance to scan both legs at the same time. But for you, if you'd like to stay with the left and then the right, please do so. So coming up now into an awareness of the ankles, this joint that allows the foot to move, perhaps scanning the circumference of the ankles, and then deep inside the ankle. Inviting the awareness now up into the bottom part of the legs, beginning with the calves, and just noticing any sensation here in the muscle of the calves. Perhaps that sensation inside the muscle, perhaps it's sensation of contact if the calves are resting on the floor or a chair. And then coming around to the shins. Perhaps noticing the difference between the shins and the calf, the hard and the soft. And then coming up into the knees, an awareness of the sides of the knees. The front of the knees, the kneecaps. Coming around to the back of the knees. As we continue scanning the body, we may notice parts that don't have any sensation at all. And then being with that experience, what is it like to not be able to feel a body part? How does the mind respond to that? Again, no right or wrong. Just being curious and investigating. And then allowing the awareness to move up into the upper part of the legs, the thighs. And let's start with scanning the inner thighs. Around to the outer thighs. the tops of the thighs, deep into the muscles of the thighs, an awareness of the hamstrings, the palms, <laughs> and if you're noticing an urge to move or scratch, or fidget, just welcome that as part of the present moment. It's not wrong or bad. 
an invitation to just be with what it's like to have that urge to move. And if you need to move, go ahead and move. Let's take a moment to zoom the awareness out and hold an awareness of the entire leg from the hip bones down to the toes. It's a moment of appreciation here for these legs and feet that allow us to move around the world. And remembering the body is a storehouse of our personal histories, our injuries, our traumas. As we continue scanning through the body, if anything uncomfortable or unpleasant or overwhelming arises, please take good care of yourself, take a break, Open your eyes, return back to the body when and if you're ready. And now coming up into the area of the hips and the pelvis, scanning the left hip for sensation. The right hip. Scanning deep into the pelvic floor. Bringing the awareness to the genitals. And then down to the buttocks, feeling any sensations here, perhaps contact, pressure. holding an awareness of the hips and the pelvis, all the systems that are contained in this area. Moment of appreciation for the ability to sit down, for the legs to connect to the upper body, the systems of elimination, reproduction. And continuing our journey up through the body, coming to the lower back starting at the tailbone and moving up into the coccyx, the sacrum, the lumbar region of the back, the muscles on either side of the spinal column. And then bringing the awareness up to the middle part of the back, perhaps an awareness of the back of the rib cage the shoulder blades, coming up to the top of the back, all the way up to the shoulders, and then shifting around to the front of the torso, we'll start down in the abdomen. Just bringing the awareness gently to this part of the body and exploring what's here. Perhaps noticing movement that's associated with the breath. Maybe noticing tightness or tension. Not trying to change or fix anything, just noticing what's here. Going deeper into this part of the body and awareness of the stomach, the intestines, the system of digestion. Again, notice if the mind slips away from the sensations in the body. Or if that happens, an opportunity to reset, to let go of what it is that carried your mind away, to relax and then return back into the body when you're ready. Coming up now into the area of the diaphragm, the muscle that runs the circumference of the bottom of the rib cage. Perhaps noticing sensations here again, associated with the breath.
And then let's come up to the chest. Scanning for sensation in the muscles of the chest, the breasts if they're there, the front of the rib cage, bringing the awareness to the lungs. And notice if we shifted to the breath. See if it's possible to stay with the structure of the lungs, perhaps a sense of expansion, contraction. Coming to the heart center, is it possible to sense into the structure of the heart, perhaps a beating or a pulsing? For some, this may be vivid, for others, maybe subtle or no sensation at all. In a moment to broaden the awareness to the entire torso, all the systems and parts that are here, sense of appreciation for the spinal column that holds us upright, all the systems that are happening of digestion, the breath, the heart, the ability to love. And shifting up now to the collarbones. Coming to the tops of the shoulders and feeling the body from the inside, noticing the muscles of the shoulders, the joint of the shoulders. And as we continue scanning the body, noticing sensations that may be pleasant or unpleasant, some that may be neutral. And how does the mind respond when we come across a pleasant sensation? How does the mind respond when we come across something unpleasant? Just gaining insight to how the mind works by noticing the reactivity in this body scan. And then allowing the awareness to move down into the arms. Let's start with the upper arms, the muscles of the triceps, the bicep, the bone running from the shoulder to the elbow. An awareness of the elbows themselves. then down into the forearms, the muscle, the skin, the bones. Down into the wrist. And then let's take some time to explore the hands and fingers. First with the palms, perhaps noticing a sense of temperature or moisture. Coming around to the tops of the hands. An awareness of the thumbs. And then scanning each finger. And remembering that no matter how many times the mind wanders away from the sensations in the body, it has no indication of how skilled we are at meditation. It's the return from the wandering mind that we're practicing, strengthening the pathways to presence. With that, let's broaden the awareness to the arms from the shoulders all the way down to the fingers. The moment of appreciation here for these arms, these hands, these fingers, if we have them. The ability to feed ourselves, to bathe ourselves, to touch, to move things around. And 
and then gathering the attention and coming up into the neck. And a lot happening in a small area. And the spinal column and all the bundles of nerves running through that. You have the throat, the vocal cords, the windpipe, top of the esophagus. All the muscles of the neck that are holding the head up and allow us to move the head around. And then coming up into the head, let's start by scanning the scalp, noticing any sensations or lack of sensation here on the scalp. the crown of the head, and then around the forehead, the temples, the eyebrows, coming down into the area of the eyes, let's start with the eyelids. Is it possible to sense into the eyeballs? And then the area behind the eyes, down into the sinuses, the cheeks, the nose bone at the top of the nose, the cartilage, the nostrils, and then coming down into the area of the mouth, starting with an awareness of the lips and any sensations or lack of sensation here in the lips. inside the mouth and sensing the teeth, the tongue, the roof of the mouth, underneath the tongue, coming out to an awareness of the chin. And then scanning along the jaw all the way back to the ears. And it's not very often that we sense into the structure of the ear. So taking a moment just to explore what that might be like. The outer ear. The cartilage of the ear. Moving to the inner ear, the eardrum. Notice how easy it is for the awareness to slip into listening. But here we're feeling the ear. And then another uh, part of the body that we're not used to feeling into, the brain. What is that like to sense into the brain? And again, notice if the awareness slips into thoughts. See if it's possible to rest with an awareness of the structure of the brain. And then broaden the awareness once again to Hold the entire head in your attention and in a moment of appreciation for all the senses that are happening here. Sense of sight, smell, taste, hearing, thinking. And now let's start to zoom the awareness out Sensing into the head and now adding the shoulders and the arms. 
and now the torso, feeling the entire upper half of the body. And now adding the hips and the pelvis, the legs and the feet. So just resting here for a moment in awareness of the entire somatic field of the body. Perhaps your awareness is going to a particular body part or sensation that's coming forward. Or maybe you're just resting with the totality of the vessel of the body. And before we come to an end of this practice, let's take a moment to appreciate this body. Even through injury or disease, even in the unpleasant moments or difficult relationships that we have with parts of the body, this vessel has allowed us to be here right now, to practice, to experience the world around us. So perhaps taking a moment to offer a silent thank you in your mind to this body, even the parts that we may not feel so good about. Now releasing your awareness from the sensations in the body. And before we end, let's just take a moment to see what's here now. Has anything shifted in the mind? Was that practice calming and relaxing? Or perhaps it was irritating and agitating that stirred things up. Remembering no right or no wrong. And now as we come to an end of the practice, taking your time to transition back to open eyes if you've had them closed and inviting any movement, stretches, or moving the body in any other way that would feel supportive to transition from the inner world back to the outer world. So thank you all for practicing with me. We'll take some time just to talk about that practice, uh, what that may have been like for you, what it was like to notice different parts of the body and the sensations, the wandering mind, any questions that you may have about the practice. So what did you notice? If you're online, uh, you can either type into the chat or um, you can raise your hand and, uh, and then Karen will unmute you. Hello, online people. <laughs> um, I was just saying, I'm never not aware of my lower back because it's always in jeans. So it just feels very burdensome in the posture and the position. And the feeling of not having the sensation in other parts of my body is like, oh, that feels good to not have the sensation. Hmm. Also, my mind is just wandering. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Actually, can you hold on to that for a second? Um, just if you, I'm curious if you feel up for answering, you're, you're describing the other areas of the body where there was a lack of sensation that's feeling good. Can you tell a little bit more about what that was like in that moment where you would notice that? Yeah, like when I noticed that other parts, like I say good, it's not like euphoric or gastric or anything, but it's like, 
a lack of paint means the school is just realizing like when you have no complaints, those that's good. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And the wandering mind, yeah, you know, I don't know, for some reason, for me personally, in the body scan, it seems to really go. <laughs> I didn't say it in this time, but sometimes I'll say when I'm guiding, you know, if, you, if you're just waking up from falling asleep, or you've been off thinking about your to-do list, welcome back, you know, and if you notice that the mind is wandering, you're here, right, you're already present by noticing that the mind is wandering, and then you can choose to come back into the body, and that's really the muscle of mindfulness, the choice when that split second when we realize oh i'm no longer with the practice you're with the practice and then you can choose to come back to wherever we are in the body scan and that's the choice that's the room for choice that we're trying to open up in life outside off the cushion as we say what else did you notice Mm. This is the only kind of meditation that works for me. That makes sense. Okay. Kind of, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A little bit. Okay. Is it better now? Nice. Okay. So body scans are the. This is the only kind of meditation that works for me. Mm. And. I was talking to Noam about this when I came in that I've been feeling a little restless since last night. I came in the morning, I was meditating, it felt a little and I could feel my mind wandering, but it wasn't as much. It was very easy for me right now to be present yeah. in my body, yeah. which was a good thing, I feel. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for sharing that. And if it feels okay answering this, you, you mentioned that it's the only type of meditation that works for you. What does work, what does that mean? Like it works for you? Uh, by work, when I say it works, it means, uh, well, guided meditations, usually I, my mind starts wandering. I, I can't really follow what you, what the person who's leading this talking about mm -hmm. my mind just wanders mm -hmm. but when i'm present in my own body instead of focusing on what the other person is saying mm -hmm. it's just easier for me to grasp onto something yeah which is not very really meditative now that i stayed out loud but which in some ways is mm -hmm. at least for me yep thanks for sharing that yeah and so just to add to that uh it also relates with a bunch of emotions in different parts of my body mm. I felt that and the thing that you said about uh, experience what's going on in your brain in the matter of you. It's funny, I experienced that last week for the first time. And I was I felt a little bit of that again today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Chantal's class last week and mm -hmm. it was it was what happened last week was something that's never happened to me in the past. Mm -hmm. And I felt just just trying to get a bad this week, but just 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 recollecting that. Mm. Just, you know, that's mm. good. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think that, you know, having sen sensation, whether we're sitting still or even in moving meditation or walking meditation, sensation is usually one of the most strongest senses that we have, touch. Um, interoception, the feeling from the body, from the inside, so that we can anchor into that. Um, th the reason I was asking what your perception of working for a meditation is because even when the mind is wandering and we can't feel sensations, it's still working. Even when we go into the gym and we're lifting weights and it's hard and it's uncomfortable and it might be painful, it's still doing the job. It's still strengthening the muscle. So it's really nice when we have a meditation that calms and relaxes us. And it's also really good practice when we have a meditation that's very erratic or uncomfortable because we're learning how to meet that moment. So there's both, you know, there can be both there, enjoying those pleasant moments and then kind of holding steady through the uncomfortable ones as a practice. 
awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Uh huh. Uh, when if if I go to go to a guided meditation session and my mind starts wandering and I don't personally I don't feel any different from when I'm sitting by myself. Mm -hmm. My mind is still wandering and I'm doing the exact same thing with just my eyes open. Mm -hmm. So there's no physical distraction, but I mean no no visual distraction, but my mind's still doing the same thing that I'm doing with the guided meditation. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe time for one more if anyone would like to share. We have yeah. one here. Oh, sorry. Great. Paul, you can go ahead. Yes, I really enjoy the body scan too because I'll make an I statement out of that. My, my mind is always on. So to be able to focus more on the body is really a great thing. And, you know, I appreciate it when you said, you know, to focus on a body part, but don't move it because that seemed to be automatically the first thing when you say oh you know your your big toe you know i'm going to stretch my big toe so to be able to do that without focusing on the movement was a very good thing for me and really enjoy that body meditation because like i say the mind it's always a mind thing when we're doing different meditations it's think about this or focus on that or don't focus on this but to be able to have the body incorporated, I think is really a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, with the mind too, we've been hearing, you know, everyone kind of sharing, this is really about our relationship with the mind. And I love this analogy of meditation is kind of like going to a busy restaurant and having a conversation with a friend that you can focus and listen to the friend and be engaged in that conversation and still be aware of all the chatter that's happening in the restaurant around you. So just because the mind is going off in a million different dif different directions doesn't mean that we can't be with our friend, which was whatever sense that we're, we're working with. So whether it's the body or the breath or feelings, emotions, um, all of that can be there. All of that noise can be there. <laughs> 24th Street can still be there, you know, but we can be um, with these sensations in the body or whatever anchor that we've chosen. So thank you for sharing. Um, for those online, if anything comes up, any questions or other insights, please feel free to write them in the chat. And some of this we're gonna come back to uh, as we move into this teaching on attachment. <laughs> Um, so in the body scan, in the secular practices, we use the body scan as one of the primary tools of developing awareness. It's a big part of the Dharma as well. It's kind of, we use it in the first and second foundation of mindfulness, which is exactly how the Buddha taught awareness of sensation and then awareness of feeling tones. So not just the sensation, but then how do we respond to it? If we notice a pleasant sensation in one part of the body, are we hoping that that lasts? Are we grabbing onto it? Do we hope when we get to the other side, it's going to feel the same way? And then vice versa, when it's an unpleasant sensation, how does the mind respond? We try and move, get rid of it. Um, and it's a very delicate line of taking care of ourselves, listening to when we might need to move, but then also exploring it a little bit. What would it be like to not move right now? Um, before I go into some more of the overt teaching on attachment, I want to just call out that you might be hearing some terms as I teach that sound like th therapy, psychotherapy, like attachment or craving, or if we move into a conversation around addiction. And I just want to preference the teaching with um, that this is not therapy, this is not psychotherapy. We're using mindfulness as a tool that can be part of therapy or part of a recovery process. Um, but these teachings are in with what we call the standard range of human suffering. <laughs> um, and um, with that also, I'm going to be talking about things like dopamine, neurotransmitters. And so knowing that there is an intersection here with the Dharma, with mental health, with the way that the brain is structured or trauma that the brain has experienced. And that's best left for medical professionals. Mindfulness can be part of a toolkit, um, but in tonight's teaching, we're just gonna be exploring what is it like rather than actually trying to fix anything. 
Uh, also, I want to say bring a beginner's mind because a lot of us that are Dharma practitioners have probably heard many teachings on attachment. Um, so see, you know, something new comes up for you tonight. So attachment and the Dharma. <laughs> so everything in the Dharma, which is the teachings of the Buddha, is about the alleviation of suffering. And the way that the Buddha laid that out for us in a framework of looking first at why do we suffer? Uh, and it's this idea of a false sense of separation, that we believe that we're a separate and an independent I, that we have senses that tell us that we're separate from each other. Yet that's not actually the truth, the ultimate truth of the way things are. And so what happens in this delusion of the way that things are is we feel sensation because we have this sense of separation. So first we feel a sensation and then we label it with a feeling tone. Oh, that feels good or that feels bad or that feels neutral. And so what do we do when something feels bad? Push it away, we try and change it. That's a version. And when something feels good, we try and grab onto it. We try and make it last longer. We want more of it. We want it to happen again. Um, <clears throat> and so it's this attachment and aversion that is the fundamental basis of suffering. Um, and so uh, when we're trying to grab onto something that is impermanent and changing, we're going to suffer. If we're trying to grab onto something that we can't control, then we're going to suffer. If we try and push away something that feels uncomfortable, we all know what happens when we try and push away thoughts or uncomfortable feelings in the body, they just get louder. <laughs> so there's a lot of, that's kind of like the Dharma, Dharmic perspective on it, using that language. Other reasons of why we might attach to things that are feeling good, because there's this epidemic in our society of feeling lack, that we're not enough, that we don't have enough, we feel empty. And so we're trying to attach to things that feel good to kind of fill a void. Fear that we might lose the feeling, the good feeling, fear that it might never come again. Uh, and then wanting it to last longer. We want it to, we want to feel that, that thing that we're attaching to. We want it to last for a long time. We want it to happen over and over again. And none of these things are inherently bad. It's noticing when they become destructive when our behaviors start pulling us out of alignment with our values, with our ethics, so we can go on that search for the, the feel good or pushing away the uh, things that don't feel good. Also, as a side note, because we talk about mindfulness as part of a system of ethics, is that this is also the root of compassion. If we weren't with feeling pleasant things and feeling unpleasant things, we wouldn't have that common humanity. We know that all life, whether it's human, animal, plants, every form of life is trying to feel good and push away things that feel bad. And being mindful of that is the doorway to compassion, which is a whole other class, uh, which will be coming. <laughs> um, so the, the main problem with all of this attachment is that it's pulling us out of the present moment. We're actually missing what's here. Uh, my teacher always says, you know, everyone at a beautiful sunset pulling their cameras out to try and take it, that they've lost, they're not there. I don't necessarily agree with that because I do think that there is something something valid about capturing uh, a beautiful sunset and sharing it with your friends or reminiscing on a beautiful moment. I think it's when we start, you know, really fidgeting with the phone and trying to get the perfect picture and, oh, that person needs to get out of the way, they're ruining the shot. That's when it takes us out of the moment when we're feeling pleasant things in the body and we want it to last longer, that takes us out of feeling the pleasantness in the body. So really one of the themes here is just being aware, being aware when things are feeling good and not trying to grab onto it. Um, there's this pushing and pulling that happens, pushing away of the aversion and pulling in of the things that feel good. And I like to think of ourselves as kind of this like channel, this conduit. And when we're constantly pushing and pulling, we're knocked off center. Um, going back to that comment on lack, we all feel like there's something missing or that we're not enough or that we feel empty. We're trying to fill a void. And my personal experience is realizing that void is supposed to be there. This is the way that the, the energy of the universe flows through us. Um, and when we're trying to grab on and push away, we're not there for it. We can't allow that experience to be there and, and be present with it. 
So can we experience pleasant feelings and pleasant events in an unattached way? And in the Dharma, there's a funny example of um, where His Holiness the Dalai Lama says one of the best ways to practice non-attachment to a loved one is to imagine them as their skeleton, their, the disgusting parts of their body, the bile, as a way of not becoming too attached. For me, that doesn't really work because then I'm just turned off. <laughs> but I do appreciate the thinking, the, the thought process behind that of looking at our attachments and then really exploring, is this an image that we're painting or is it actually truth? <clears throat> and this is kind of where some of the secular comes in. So that's more of the Dharma aspect of things, where from a scientific perspective that we know that when something feels good, dopamine fires in the brain. And the more that we repeat that, the more networks of neurons form around that dopamine release. This is kind of the roots of addiction, the roots of craving mind. Um, and so what the practice is, is to bring awareness to that, notice that, a lot of times what happens is the thoughts start firing. We were talking about the mind wandering. The thoughts start looping. I want more of this. How can I make this last longer? Really, if we actually just drop down and feel into the body, we interrupt that cycle of looping thoughts. So it's another way of kind of being with what's happening, but not attaching to it. It also doesn't mean that we shouldn't be feeling good. It doesn't mean that we need to renounce everything and turn away from pleasure. In the emotional balance course that I teach, we talk about hedonic happiness versus eudaimonic happiness, feeling good from things that are happening outside of us versus feeling good from the inside, the light within. And again, it's just bringing awareness to that. This is a source of my happiness to not latch on and grab too hard onto it. And so where these two kind of come together, the secular and the dharma, is this awareness and compassion. So being mindful, being with the experience of attachment, being with the pleasant experience, experiencing all the sensations that come with that, all the dopamine hits that we're getting when something feels good. And then the compassion. It makes sense that I want to hang on to this, but I do need to let it go. It's an awareness of the impermanence of life mixed with that compassionate, that kind attention to what's happening. So in uh, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is the secular program that I teach, we talk about this as pleasant events. And so we're gonna do a little practice here, but we ask students in this course to notice for a week, each day when a pleasant event happens and take a moment to pause and notice how it feels in the body. And then from the feeling in the body, how the emotions and the mood are affected. And then from emotions and mood, how our thoughts are affected. So it's this tool that helps us bring awareness, uh, which I said, as I said, we're gonna practice in a moment. But also very interconnected with all of this is gratitude, which is another aspect of the practice that is starting to become more researched right now. I spent a year living in a monastery in the Himalayas and in the first nine months, I did not hear the word gratitude mentioned at all, which I was really surprised about because that's a big part of my practice. I've been exposed to it through a lot of different teachers. And when I asked my teacher, why are we not talking about gratitude? Her response was because it reinforces the sense of a separate self. I have this. It also can create some competition or jealousy issues. You know, if I have this, they don't have that. I'm so grateful for this. So even in gratitude, there can be this kind of trap of grabbing, clinging, uh, reifying the self as something solid and permanent. So when we practice this pleasant events or this gratitude appreciation, like we did in that body scan, the invitation, a moment to be grateful for the legs because they can move us around, grateful for our arms because we can feed ourselves. These are things that we just bring to mind, not that we grab onto it. Um, and so there's so many different benefits of gratitude. I think that will probably also be a separate class. Um, but just knowing that appreciating what we do have, the sense of enoughness, it really helps cut through some of that lack that creates the attachment, it creates the grabbing, where if we can just be grateful for this moment, for what it is that we do have right now, rather than going out and trying to grab everything around us, 
it really helps center and ground us in this moment. So what do y'all think about that? How does that how does that land for you? What comes up when you hear these concepts around attachment and um, gratitude and dopamine? Is this something that rings true for you? Do you notice these patterns in your life? It seems fairly, fairly obvious. But I don't think that is where it all came from. But what I do remember is one of the things that really struck me when I first started to learn about Buddhism was the aversions. You know, I it took me a while to understand that that is just as as harmful to your equanimity as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think, you know, it's different for all of us. Some of us have that, um, As and what was your name? Alex. As Alex was sharing, um, kind of the aversion aspect of this comes up in a bigger way. For some people, they don't see the problem of feeling good or are, you know, that striving to um, to cultivate pleasant feelings. How is that a problem? Uh, and so it's the suffering that can come from our attachments rather than just being with the pleasantness, pleasantness. So thanks for, for sharing. So let's do a short practice. <clears throat> so this will just be a few minutes. Perhaps you like to close the eyes. Maybe lower them down to a surface in front of you. And in this practice, we're going to turn our attention to pleasant feelings. So the invitation here is to call to mind something good that's happening in your life right now. And maybe it's a specific event. Maybe it's a material object. Maybe it's a relationship. Just taking a moment to call to mind something pleasant that's happening in your life right now. Perhaps you'd like to visualize this happening if it's an object or an event. Maybe just resting with the knowing that it's taking place. And as you rest your attention on this good thing that's happening, notice any sensations that may arise in the body. For me, gratitude always comes with a sense of opening in my chest or a feeling of pressure coming off of my back. It's different for everyone. Just noticing what it feels like. Noticing if any emotions arise. Remembering we're just exploring here. So keeping part of the attention anchored in this good thing that's happening. And then part of the attention, noticing the response in the body, in the mind. Notice if there's particular thoughts that are arising. And if you notice the mind slips into narration or becomes distracted, you can return back to that good thing that's happening. And then tracking the feelings in the body, 
thoughts in the mind. Staying here for another minute more. If you are working with a sensation in the body that's arising, perhaps letting go of the visualization or the thinking about what's good and just rest with the feeling of it. Notice if there's a craving for more. Notice if there's mental activity around how to make this last longer. So we know from modern research that the benefits of gratitude are not just thinking about what's good, but feeling it. and also expressing our gratitude. So perhaps silently in the mind offering a thank you to a person, to an object, to yourself for this good thing. Maybe there's a way after this class or tomorrow that you can express your thanks in a bigger way. But for now, just notice, how does it feel to offer that silent thank you? And then letting go of any thought forms or visualizations and just taking a moment before we come back together as a group to notice how it is right now, any shift in mind or body after that short reflection. And then on the next exhale, letting go of this practice and taking your time to return back to open eyes if they were closed. So what did you notice in that reflection? What was that like? I can't see. Mm -mm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> oh, hi. Yeah, I was wondering if you could see it. Um, I was just wanting to thank you for that gratitude practice. I was sort of having like a real time moment of my kid. I could hear them loudly in the other room and jumping and screaming. And I wanted to sort of be like, ah, stop it. Be quiet. <laughs> Um, you're going to, or I'm going to unmute and then it's going to be really loud. And then you brought in the gratitude and it was, I was able to feel a pretty immediate shift into like, oh yeah, I'm actually really grateful that I love him so much and that he's here and that he's healthy and happy and jumping. And it was a nice shift away from like him being a burden or an annoyance or something like that you know that sort of feels icky as a parent and um I got to shift into like oh yes I do I'm actually really grateful um for all the noise out there mm -hmm. and how does thank you for sharing that Karen and how does it feel now uh good I feel open more open and relaxed I think, you know, I was starting to sort of like, you know, starting to tint up a little bit. Um, and it was able to sort of relax in my body uh, mm. with it too. And so it was really nice. 
sounds pleasant. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Karen is describing something that we know from a scientific perspective when we practice gratitude is that the body stops producing cortisol, stress hormone. So one of the easiest ways to shift out of a fight or flight or a triggered response is to look for something that feels good, not to bypass and not to sugarcoat, but to help send the signal to the body that the, the stress hormone is not needed right now. Um, so I think that that's a, you know, I think what we're illustrating here is there's this fine line, you know, how appreciating things that are pleasant and being grateful can, can help us navigate life, but not attach to it. So there's this kind of gray area for where it's really supportive to feel what's good and feel gratitude, and then kind of where it turns into the enemy. And that's really what we're bringing our awareness to in this class. So thank you for pointing to that, Karen. I'm also interested in seeing where that enemy lies in the gratitude. I'm not sure I've felt it maybe a little bit, but I was, I wanted to thank you for that too, because I feel like that's an interesting thing to look out for. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things with your example is notice the next time he's being loud <laughs> and wanting that, wanting that moment of gratitude again, and it might not be there, you know? So that's part of the attachment. You know, it's, it's so enjoyable when the good thing's happening to just let it be in that moment. It might not happen. It might not happen in our next practice, like an enjoyable sensation that we feel in one practice might not be there the next time we sit down. So there's a different lesson to be learned there. So, gratitude gives those kind of sensations in my body. I it felt pretty similar to when what I feel when I'm restless. Restless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it? Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Yeah. So what I was saying was uh, the body, the sensations in my body were very similar to what I feel when I'm restless. And my, well, I was grateful, but my mind started building stories around it. And then I started feeling good about the stories, but also I started finding issues with that. And yeah, when I came out of it, I was a little off. I wasn't, I was more centered with the meditation practice, but right now I don't feel that calm or that centered. I don't know if that's and how are you how are you relating to that feeling right now? What, what do you mean by that? If you you're saying that you're not feeling as calm and centered from the other practice, mm -hmm. so what kind of feeling tone does that have for you? The fact that you're feeling a bit restless right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not as calm as I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not I'm not saying I'm restless, but it's not the same. Of comfort I have in my own skin right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you had pointed to the mind creating stories around the gratitude. So the minute that we notice that the mind is shifting into narration or thinking about what's happening, we're no longer with it anymore. And so this is part of the attachment thing where it's kind of like, can we be can we be with what's happening and not go into the stories behind it or the negativity bias around it or the doubt you know we are wired to scan for things that are wrong that's a part of our survival mechanism as humans and this is why gratitude and and being with pleasant events is so important because it helps widen the aperture widen the lens so we can see and be with things that are pleasant without automatically reverting to that scanning for something wrong. 
I'm not saying that's actually what was happening with you, but the mental formations that were coming up around the feeling of gratitude is, was what would be considered in the practice to be a hindrance or the mind wandering. When we visualize things, when we think about sensations, that these are all mental formations. This is all the mind wandering away from the feeling. So one of the um, things that I like to practice personally on this is uh, calling to mind something good, notice what's happening in my body. And then when the thoughts start coming in, of, I hope this happens again. I wonder, can I make that last longer? I'm, no, I'm not with the feeling anymore. And this is one of the things, whether it's Dharma or secular teaching, coming back to the feeling, noticing that the attention is getting lost in the mind, coming back into the feeling in the body is the best, is one of the most efficient ways of interrupting the looping interrupting the emotional episode this is what you know it's super corny but the term the term you got to feel it to heal it we have to feel what's happening in our system rather than just thinking about it and also when we are thinking about it that's great practice too because we're noticing how that's stirring things up for us so it might not feel calm and centered but it's the work it's doing the work so thank you for sharing that Anything else you were noticing during that kind of reflection on a pleasant event? I see something in the chat. It was nothing. I was pasting the. Oh, okay. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, though. Yeah. I it wasn't so strong for me during the sit. Um, and I don't actually, I mean, I do a little gratitude practice at the beginning of end of every meditation, but not usually during the meditation. And I think that it is a good antidote when things are rough, which is a whole nother kind of you know, uh, thing. But, but in my life, I've been practicing gratitude in off the cushion in a very uh, deliberate way for a few years now. And it, it, it really is what you described. Like it has become more of a habit. And it's like, I just notice it more. And I think for me, uh, what was, uh, what has changed, it's to some extent it's changed how much I notice it, but also my ability to express it it was really hard for me to express my gratitude some number of years ago. And now I really, I can just tell people, oh, you know, I can thank people for whatever, or just tell them what I appreciate about them or the situation. And it's kind of profound, really, difference in my life. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell, talk a little bit more about that? Like, how does it, how does that feel for you when you express it? Um, it really changes the nature of my connection to other people and it, and they appreciate it and it changes, you know, their outlook and then my outlook. And, and it's not like a, I don't know, it can sound a little like a, you know, a feel good kind of thing, but it, 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 it I, I, and I think actually I'll say like, why it's not just some kind of self-helpy thing is it actually makes it easier to also talk about problems and when things are not good you know so there's like this basis of you know i've told you what i appreciate about you now let me tell you something that's not working for me <laughs> you know it's not and it doesn't feel like an attack it feels like that the basis is is gratitude and then i can build on that whatever it is, whatever uh, I want to talk about. It's an issue. Yeah, beautiful. It's like creating space for that to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I really like what you're saying too about that it becomes a habit. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, I teach in the NICU. So parents that are new parents very quickly, unexpectedly, prematurely, their babies are in distress. And we ask them to be grateful. 
that's really hard, you know, uh, in a moment of extreme distress to think about even, even the small things. But practice over time, it starts wiring the neurons to have a broader perspective. We know mindfulness is affecting the prefrontal cortex, which is where perspective taking happens. And so when we form a, a habit around this kind of broad spaciousness that gratitude brings us over time, that when stress arrives uh, or suffering in Dharma terms arrives, we're approaching it with a wider lens. Uh, we're able to not balance. I always, when I teach about gratitude, it's not about there's this many things that are wrong and I need to think about this many things that are right because sometimes that's <laughs> going to be impossible. It's about the habit of, you know, for me, I do three things, three things at random times during the day, three things that I'm grateful for. And I just take a moment to feel that that's the habit building so that my mind is kind of balancing out that negativity bias, that constant survival mechanism to look for the thing that's wrong, that's a threat, right? And then miss all these other beautiful things that are happening. That doesn't usually happen in the moment of extreme emotion or stress. It's something that we have to practice over time. And I love, Noam, how you were saying that you start and begin your practices, your, I'm assuming your, your mindfulness or your meditation practices with gratitude. That's a way of kind of bringing it in. I've heard other people say, you know, just when you wake up in the morning before you open your eyes, just feel the sheets, feel the air, uh, a moment of gratitude for your bed, for the shelter. That's another way of, of making it a habit. But in in bringing it back to the class and the theme of attachment, this is, it's kind of like gratitude is almost like the healthy attachment. You know, I'm grateful for what's here. I'm feeling it in the body and I'm expressing it. And that's what the science is showing us that it's not just about feeling it. It's also the thank you, a meaningful heartfelt thank you that can kind of interrupt some of that grabbing. Cause then all of a sudden you have this other feel good that's happening um, from expressing your thanks. Dare I say gratitude is the antidote to attachment. <laughs> That's up to you. Anything else? Any other questions or comments about the, the topic of tonight or your experience and the practices? Anything that you're not sure of? Um. The irony of it for me, I think, is that people who have the most luxuries tend to feel the least amount of gratitude, which I'm wondering if there's a way to like flip that where you don't have, like people who suffer more tend to experience more gratitude because we learn to be grateful for the small things. But is there a way to also have like gratitude to that extreme without the suffering. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's possible, but I'm wondering what people's perspectives are. I wish we had another half hour to because this is this is great. I mean anything anything come up for anyone? I, mean, I think there was a question that was posed to the group, right? Yeah. How do we maybe it's more rhetorical? Rhetorically, yeah, and just like yes. The thought. Yeah. Why do we have to suffer? And I mean, I don't mean like we, like I know there's like relations of suffering, but people who seem to have it or worse also seem to be the most grateful. It's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And as we were talking about before, it's also the doorway to compassion. You know, so it's those of us that suffer and all we're all suffering in different ways, but this is the first noble truth. There is suffering in the world, and this is the doorway to insights like this, you know. Yeah, and and I think one thing to kind of close with, too, is that it doesn't gratitude, appreciation, these pleasant feelings doesn't mean that we have that we're millionaires, right? Because sometimes there's suffering there the God realm, you know, that we want more of it. A lot of times the, the people that have the most resources are the ones that are the most scared of losing it. Um, and the ones that don't have it have learned how to appreciate what they do have. It's this sense of enoughness. So I really, I, that's really moving that you're able to, um, to bring that forward. Thank you. 
Okay, so we're just about time. Um, so uh, at the Dharma Center, we like to end our classes with a dedication. So just a short moment of reflection. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes, maybe just lower them down, just for a minute or two of our final practice together tonight. And thinking about the energy that we've been cultivating here, practicing an awareness of sensations in the body listening to the teachings, both the sacred and the secular on pleasant events and attachment. Exploring those aspects in our own experience through gratitude. And perhaps you'd like to dedicate the energy that we've been cultivating tonight to a person or a group, perhaps to the alleviation of suffering of all beings. And we'll close our time together tonight with some aspirations. So just resting with the sentiments of these words. May all beings know happiness without the suffering of attachment. May all beings be present for and savor the pleasant experiences life has to offer. May all beings have enough, know that they are enough exactly as they are. And may all beings be free. If it feels okay, lowering the head in a bow, a gesture of respect to not only the teachings and each other, but to our own path towards the enlightened mind. Together as a group, let's follow one breath deeply into the body. And as we exhale, letting go of this dedication, letting go of this class and preparing to move into the next moments of life, carrying forward any insights or wisdom that we've gained tonight for the benefit of all beings. So thank you all for being here with me tonight. This is a monthly class. I think it's pretty obvious next month we're going to be talking about aversion. <laughs> so I hope to see you on the first Tuesday of next month. Um, I also will be offering another mandala meditation workshop in the fall. We haven't set a date yet, but the first one went really well. So um, it's a, uh, using mandalas as practice in meditation. Um, so keep an eye out for that on the schedule. Anything else, Karen or no? Okay. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs>